Okay. Um, okay, so this fifth webinar, uh, uh, we have um, um, been, yeah, um, we have been um, uh, going through a number of webinars already. Um, uh, uh, no, webinar number one was about extracting the essential principles of uh, validation and good in vitro method uh, practices for uh, new approach methods. Uh, that are intended to become uh, OEC test guidelines. Um, in the, the blue box there, you have some of the key uh, messages. Uh, the second webinar was about uh, new approaches uh, in uh, ecotoxicology uh, um, uh, for um, cross-species extrapolation uh, uh, and tools. The third webinar was about scientific and test methods readiness of emerging technologies, uh, the criteria, some examples, and the experience. Um, the fourth webinar was, in divide, was divided in, uh, in two parts. Uh, the first part was on reproducibility issues uh, from the technical perspective in toxicological studies, uh, mostly in vitro and how they affect the emergence of uh, new approach uh, methods with a number of uh, key uh, messages and key points there. And the second part uh, uh, was about, um, sorry, probabilistic modeling, uh, uh, making better use of uh, quantitative information from in vitro assays, uh, taking into account uncertainty also we heard about some examples of application and uh, where uh, they might fit uh, these uh, uh, approaches in the data interpretation with also some uh, key points. I'd like to remind uh, all of you from the WNT that you have the recordings, uh, you have the presentations from these webinars, and you also have uh, the uh, key messages, key points uh, summarized uh, uh, after each webinar on the uh, WNT uh, community site. So here is the, the program for today uh, uh, on identifying reference chemicals and building curated data sets. Uh, we will hear uh, from uh, Laura Taylor uh, from the uh, US EPA Office of uh, Research and Development um, and from uh, Barbara uh, Kubikova uh, from uh, the uh, UK Health and Safety uh, Agency. And just uh, a, few, um, a few words, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce them. Uh, so uh, first, um, uh, Laura uh, is um, uh, at the US EPA Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure, where she is a postdoc and mentored by uh, Richard Just Judson, uh, who is online today as well. Her current research uh, is focused on improving new approach methodologies, including uh, by refining reference chemical curation methods uh, and analyzing high throughput transcriptomics uh, data. She received her PhD in environmental sciences and engineering uh, and her master's uh, degree in toxicology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, Barbara uh, Kubikova conducted her PhD as a Marie Curie uh, Fellow at uh, the Research Center for uh, Toxics Compounds in the Environment, Resetox, at uh, Masaryk University in Gno, uh, in the Czech Republic, under supervision of uh, Professor Clara Ilcherova and Pavel Babika on health risk of natural toxins in surface water. In 2020, Barbara started to work uh, with the UK HSA, uh, formerly uh, Public Health England, uh, on the Horizon 2020 project Goliath, uh, uh, investigating metabolism, disrupting chemicals, and developing test methods uh, uh, to assess metabolic disruption under Miriam Jacobs' uh, lead. She uh, coordinates the test method pre-validation activities within the Goliath project and contribute uh, to the development of a, a conceptual IATA for metabolism uh, disruption. 
So um, webinar is recorded. Uh, if you want to uh, interact, ask questions, uh, please use the chat box uh, um, to raise questions or make comments. Uh, a short uh, webinar report will be prepared uh, after the event uh, by the Secretariat and uh, the steering group uh, team. And um, Let's remember also that uh, this webinar, uh, the, the purpose of this series of webinars is to collect food for thoughts uh, for the December workshop of the WNT uh, uh, to reflect on the, the challenges uh, with the standardization and validation of uh, new methods and emerging technologies. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, I close my introduction. Uh, um, and uh, we'll go to our first uh, speaker, Laura, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to tell you more about the work that we're doing at the EPA on this topic of refining reference chemicals and building those curated data sets. So reference chemicals are important so that we can validate new assays and be able to better predict adverse outcome pathways for chemicals, existing and new chemicals as well. And a reference chemical is one that gives consistent results of being active or inactive across multiple different assays that measure activity against a target or molecular mechanism. So a classic example would be um, BPA impacting estrogen receptor. And traditionally, um, the approach for uh, looking at reference chemicals and defining them has been through expert review of the literature. And this expert curation is highly labor intensive and time consuming. It's not at all scalable. And so it's impractical to do this type of manual search for most targets. Uh, so this has been done previously for estrogen receptor and androgen receptor but we do need uh, newer methods that help automate this process. So one of the things that helps a lot with that is literature mining tools. And uh, two tools uh, developed at EPA are Abstract Sifter, which is currently available. And I have the links there for where it can be downloaded. Uh, it is available on the CompTOPS dashboard now, which is very exciting. And uh, that is uh, an Excel-based tool that you can download and save on your computer. There's also Abstract R, which is developed by Bryant uh, Chambers, and that is based in R. So some coding experience is necessary. It's really great for handling high volume searches, and that will be available soon. So both of these tools query PubMed abstracts for co-occurrence of terms. Uh, so for example, you can search a chemical name against a specific gene target or um, some other um, more broad thing like um, certain types of cell stress like DNA damage response and um, those sorts of things and get a, an, a, an idea of how often that chemical and the gene target are being mentioned together in abstracts and the higher that count is, the more likely it is that there's some sort of impact there in relationship uh, between the chemical and target. And uh, Abstractor further does a pairwise mutual information PMI scoring normalization method, uh, which uh, further helps understand for um, that, that chemical target relationship. The higher that score is, uh, the stronger that relationship. And then uh, there are many other databases online as well that we can harness data from for uh, better understanding the targets of different chemicals. So RefchemDB is uh, led by Richard Judson, and uh, that is looking across many different databases, and that's listed here on the right. So there's Kimball, Drug Bank, uh, LitDB, ProDrug, open targets, ToxCast, all sorts of different data and that you then get a lot of information for the chemical itself, um, the, the name of the chemical, the chemical ID, its structure. Uh, you can learn more about the target for each of those chemicals, um, the mode of action, the source, 
the PMID and activity class. There's also um, information about the um, uh, different uh, chemical IDs and, and target types. So this database uh, currently has over 46,000 chemicals uh, that have at least one entry. Uh, so many of those are experimental drug candidates with just a single entry. And um, currently most chemicals that get uh, screened and have funding for chemical screening are drugs and drug candidates. So that is the bulk of the chemicals within this database. Uh, it is also uh, just over 6,000 environmental chemicals as well that were tested with ToxCast, Tox21 program. Um, and of those, there are about 4,400 chemicals out of the 46,000 that have at least uh, one target with a high support level, uh, which we define at five or higher. And that's for if we have consistent results across multiple assays and we have high confidence in that chemical target relationship. Uh, so not many of um, those chemicals are the environmental chemicals because not having at least five assays per target. Uh, but uh, this is a, an extremely useful resource uh, when, when trying to uh, look through reference chemicals. So that database, um, the original 2019 database is available as a supplemental Excel file in the manuscript listed here. And version 2.0 is underway. And that will include the you know, additional three years of publication since then, uh, as well as including potency data when that's available. And this here is showing the annotations from RefchemDB for chemicals that we have tested in the high throughput transcriptomics team at the US EPA. And on the X axis, you'll see those are the gene targets and the Y axis are the number of reference chemicals for each of those targets. The orange line is showing a summation for the, the percent of reference chemicals um, going across. So uh, you'll notice on the far left, estrogen receptor has a very high number of reference chemicals, which kind of throws off the scale for being able to see anything else. So here is the zoomed in view on that y-axis. And we can see for 50% of these um, reference chemicals, there's only um, eight reference chemicals or fewer for each of those targets. And um, that is most of the targets that are encompassed in this space. So um, next, I want to talk more about uh, some of the efforts we're using to automate this process. Uh, and Tox21 Cross Partner Project 8 that I'm leading is working on automating the process of reference chemical identification. So for this, we are working on having lists of both positive and negative reference chemicals for um, a few case study target genes and some cell processes. So uh, some of the genes we're looking at are estrogen and androgen receptor, which we can then uh, compare back to the expert curated list. Uh, and then also glucocorticoid receptor, retinoic acid receptor, several others. And uh, we'll be using ToxCast, Tox21 data, and the RefchemDB information that also harnesses that literature mining. And um, this will have uh, quality control steps implemented as well, um, so that we're not using cytotoxic doses. Uh, and um, this is a, a under underway project. So, uh, one of the potential applications for it is uh, towards adverse outcome pathways. Uh, you'll see the example on the bottom is for retinoic acid receptor pathway perturbation. And for those genes, they're, they're involved in um, the molecular initiating event or key events that result in that adverse outcome. So the thought is that uh, we can develop potential reference chemicals for that adverse outcome if they impact any of those genes that are important along the way in that AOP. 
Uh, an example use case uh, for reference chemicals is that it is extremely helpful for us when interpreting high throughput transcriptomics data. So when we're measuring the levels of mRNA, uh, there's uh, around 20,000 genes that we can do that for. And we have to be able to make sense of that data and what it means as the transcription levels are increasing or decreasing for those different genes. And having reference chemicals is wonderful because then we can start looking at these sort of fingerprint responses within genes of how the downstream effects um, are, are changing consistently when a particular target is impacted by uh, different chemicals. So that uh, transcriptomics fingerprint, if you will. And TOPS21 Cross Partner Project 5, um, led by EPA and NTB, by Josh Harrell and Steve Ferguson, is aiming to generate a set of transcriptomic profiles for chemicals that have target annotations in RefchemDB as a resource for aiding interpretation of the HTTR data. And that is really helpful for screening environmental chemicals. So another um, uh, project underway at the EPA right now is applying machine learning to all of this. And uh, this is also within the high throughput transcriptomics group. Uh, it's Molecular Initiating Event Machine Learning, or MEMOL, and that is led by Joseph Bundy. So that is integrating publicly available gene expression data with database, uh, with a database that links the reference chemicals to the molecular targets. And then he trains a uh, separate binary classifier uh, for each molecular initiating event to predict whether the chemicals activate that MIE that's uh, being modeled. And uh, so far, he's uh, looked into 51 different MIEs and has been able to apply this robustly for nine of those. So some of the learnings and challenges along the way, uh, as we saw before, uh, it's a bit unreasonable to require there to be 30 or more reference chemicals for a single target, like we have established for estrogen receptor and androgen receptor. So we need to have methods that provide small but very effective lists with positive and negative reference chemicals. The automation process can be very helpful for reducing bias when assigning the reference chemicals. And for transcriptomics research and other assays, it's really important that we're making sure that the gene target is expressed within the cell type being studied. And um, we're also looking for transcriptomics responses specifically, making sure that the gene target is not only expressed, but expressed enough that we can detect those downstream impacts. And um, right now it's looking maybe somewhere around 30 to 50 counts per million, um, but stay tuned for uh, that research. So some of the challenges to all of this, um, to recap with, with expert curation, that is, time-consuming and not scalable. So we, we have to be able to automate this process for assigning reference chemicals to gene targets. And um, one of the challenges with that is different forms of a chemical, the parent, metabolite, decadent, salt, all of that can impact the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, or the toxicokinetics, toxicodynamics, or the bioavailability. Um, may, may or may not see impacts there. So uh, one of the ways to address that would be to have separate annotations for the different forms of each of the chemicals. And then when interpreting all of this data and doing that MIE prediction, uh, there are 20,000 gene targets, uh, about 3,000 of which are thought to be part of the druggable genome. But yet we've only been able to apply this so far for for um, well, testing 51 MIEs and robustly apply it for nine, uh, which is very, very limited. And that's been very restricted because of the, um, the reference chemical space and, and targets within it being so small. Uh, so expanding that would help a lot with that research. Um, one of the, the challenges with this automation uh, and interpreting it is over time, we'll need to learn more and more 
about how those uh, experimental parameters might impact the chemical target findings. So the dosing levels, differences in the animal or cell model that was studied, all of that might impact the literature mining interpretation. Uh, so that is uh, something deserving of a lot of attention and refinement as we uh, get better and better at this automation process. Another thing to be aware of is that right now, pharmaceuticals and pesticides represent a lot of the data that's available in literature mining. And um, so expanding that chemical space to include more chemicals from industry and other regulatory spaces uh, is really needed. Uh, so ToxCast is um, an effort that's helping with that, um, but we definitely need to expand that more. Uh, so we're covering, covering more different types of chemistries. And then uh, another really significant challenge is publication bias. So right now, negatives aren't routinely published. It is often really hard um, for scientists to be able to publish their negative data, even if they want to. So well, we need to encourage both scientists and the journals to start publishing all of the findings, regardless of statistical significance. And the reason that's so important, specifically within the reference chemical space, is because we need to be able to identify negative reference chemicals as well. When developing new assays and validating those assays, it's critical that we make sure we're not only picking up activity where we expect there to be activity, but also not picking up activity where there shouldn't be any uh, or, or it should not be a substantial response. So publish all of your data. And uh, this shows a, a summary of um, what all I've, I've covered in this talk. So um, different methods we have, uh, starting with expert review for the manual curation of the literature uh, that progresses into literature mining with abstract sifter and abstractor tools. Uh, mining the database is covered by RefchemDB, uh, all the databases and harnessing literature mining as well. And uh, TOX21 cross-partner project number eight is working on automating the <coughs> reference control identification. And all of this really helps in being able to better predict chemical mechanisms, including through the use of um, uh, MIMO, <laughs> the uh, machine learning for molecular initiating events. The benefits of this, uh, of course, are for, for being able to help advance new approach methodologies and better understand the MIEs of chemicals and um, be able to better predict the adverse outcome pathways for them as well. And uh, this can really help with informing policy and be able to more effectively protect the public. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of my teammates on the uh, group there at NIH is involved in CPP8, and um, uh, everybody at EPA is, uh, on, most, most of those folks are all on the um, high throughput transcriptomics team. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention, and I will take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for um, this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure you'll have questions. You, you have already have some questions in the chat box. Huh? And uh, those uh, in attendance, please don't hesitate to uh, raise any additional questions in the chat box. Uh, Laura is uh, there in the next part of the, the webinar to, uh, to look and uh, and uh, answer any questions or comments you may have. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Lara. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, those in the uh, WNT workshop steering committee who helped us uh, identify our two speakers uh, today uh, on identifying uh, reference um, uh, chemicals. And uh, as you can see, the the age average of our speakers uh, is, uh, is um, yeah, um, uh, an opportunity is, is lower. <laughs> and uh, we have the chance to hear from younger scientists 
uh, today, and that's really uh, great. Um, so, um, with without further ado, uh, we'll move to our uh, next speaker, Laura. I encourage you to uh, go and check in the chat box uh, uh, and answer any uh, questions uh, you see there. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to uh, Barbara. And um, I will start with uh, noting some essential elements and the general methodological considerations that uh, underpin our um, supplementary chemical selection augmentation for the SIP enzyme induction test method. So the first criterion to consider was addressing sector diversity beyond pharmaceutical chemicals. That means we were especially interested in industrial chemicals, pesticides, food additives, or constituents. We also made sure that the chemicals proposed uh, have a good structural diversity and that a good, good proportion of negative chemicals is included. A good, good proportion means that at least a quarter of the chemicals should be negative and ideally up to 50% of the uh, selected chemicals. Where the literature was able to support a range of potency or a provisional classification of potency, we wanted to include a range of weak, moderate or strong SIP inducers and also to address the complexity of this test method and to probe the com complexity of this test method to provide chemicals that are positive for one SIP isoform while negative for another. And a, as already mentioned, a key limitation was the availability of human in vivo data. So the next best um, data available were human in vitro cell-based systems or then in decreasing uh, with decreasing strength of evidence, we also included supportive information from human ex vivo or in chemical and in silico models, as you can see here in the green box. Data from animal models were only of limited uh, utility to this chemical selection, as particularly for metabolism, there are substantial, you know, can be substantial interspecies differences, as is exemplified, for example, here for PXR activation and CYP3A4 induction. Um, yes, and more detailed information on that can be found in that publication here. Some other aspects that we considered were limitations and restrictions on international transport and use of certain chemicals. For example, chemicals that are listed under the Stockholm COPS convention, or chemicals with abuse potential were of lower priority for the chemical selection and availability of the chemicals also informed the prioritization. For example, we want to make sure that chemicals are long-term long available and economically viable. To give you a brief idea of the approach that we took, we did a broad literature database search using the Scopus and PubMed literature databases. And on a title and abstract screening, we identified candidate chemicals that then underwent expert consultation and review, including by some OECD WNT national coordinators, and identified priority chemicals that then uh, underwent more detailed chemical-specific literature database searches. In, these, um, in this more detailed search, we focused on information on a human in vivo SIP enzyme induction or human cell-based enzyme induction and uh, catalytic activity, as this test method probes not just gene expression, but the endpoint is enzyme, induction, enzyme activity induction. And that is not necessarily correlated to gene expression. From that, uh, we proposed a non-pharmaceutical augmentation proficiency chemical list. As a reminder, the pharmaceutical proficiency and reference chemicals included in the JRC validation trial 
um, are the following 10 proficiency chemicals and three reference chemicals that are probing the three different SIP isoforms that are the target endpoints of this test method. As you can also see from this table, the proportion of positive and negative chemicals included in the validation trial, um, validation study, uh, did show a good spread between positive and negative chemicals with about a third of the chemicals being negative. And here you can see the list of our proposed provisional augmentation chemical or augmentation proficiency chemicals that cover different pesticides, industrial chemicals and mm, pollutants. Yes. Um, a key difference that you can notice through the table that was presented before is that we not only uh, try to identify positive and negative chemicals, but also included potency information where this was supported by the literature. As we were looking at non-pharmaceutical chemicals, 